So we might start, okay, just with a bit of a a bit of background as to your journey, as to how you got your blog to where you're at, and, and how you uh, built Secret Bloggers Academy. Yeah, sure. So uh, my background was in uh, magazines. I worked in uh, magazines in Australia for about just over three years. Yes. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in advertising. So I was kind of, I suppose, uniquely qualified as far as to then go on and create a publishing platform for myself because I already had those both of that sort of side of things, like the business side of things and the actual content. Yes. and community building side of things. So uh, it was when I was working in magazines that um, online shopping was just starting to take off in Australia. So, uh, you know, big international stores are finally starting to deliver to us. Um, people were kind of, were still very cautious about, you know, buying things online. And I kind of saw there as a bit of an opportunity there to create a, um, a content platform which helped people know basically where they could shop online, the things to look for. Um, and it started out as like a one a day, kind of like a deal of the day kind of thing. So it's like, you can, you know, buy these awesome shoes from the US at the moment and the Australian dollar is good or it was at the time. And, you know, they're on sale or, um, you know, there's this sale on or, and, you know, just it was very sort of, um, very shopping based. Um, obviously a few years down the track, um, everyone's buying online and no one, you know, people don't sort of need that hand-holding reassurance anymore. So it started to expand. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started, I really focused on, because it was basically an email newsletter actually when it started. So building an email, like, email list was like my main focus. Mm -hmm. And I think that did prove really well, like without knowing it, like that, you know, now you speak to anyone starting a business, especially an online business, they're like, build a list, build, build a list. Um, and I just did because it was, that's what my business was. But it meant that, you know, very, very quickly, I was get had enough traffic, had enough um, you know eyeballs and enough interest that I was able to um, monetize it enough to take it full time um, in, in just under twelve months. Okay, and I read in one of your interviews that you um, started an e-commerce and that didn't work out for you. So what was it about e-commerce that you know didn't yeah. work for you? So um, e-commerce, I actually tried that. It was about four years in, we added an online store because it just sort of seemed like the natural progression. Like we're telling all these people about the stuff that they could buy online. Um, so they may as well buy some of it from us. Um, and I think it was, at the end of the day, I think it's probably when, we just, when I decided to do it, it was a bit of a knee jerk reaction. Um, I was trying to find ways of moving away from the advertising model and uh, just didn't fully comprehend the amount of work that goes into running an online store. And when we launched it, it was great. Like we had, um, cause we already had, you know, readers and a subscriber base. So we were getting, you know, a good amount of daily sales and things. But I actually, once I'd been running it for about three months and I could see actually to scale it to where we, we would want it to go would require, like I sat down and figured out actually, you know, what would be required. And I'm like, that's not a business that I want. Um, I don't want to have to have warehouses and, you know, be running, you know, that many staff and that kind of thing. Like it's always, um, I've always tried to bring it back to how do I actually, what kind of business do I want? Like how do I want it to affect my lifestyle as well? And I was just like, no, it's not, that's not actually a business I want to be running. Like I'm not that passionate about it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a hell of a lot of work. Um, which I wasn't like, I knew it was going to take work, but it's just wasn't the stuff that I wanted to be doing. So, um, I decided to just, yeah, cut the losses and yeah, we closed after about, it's only, it's only about three months. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose as an entrepreneur, beyond just the money that you get from it, why do you do what you do? Why do you have Drop Dead Gorgeous Daily? What is it about that website that just makes you want to keep doing it every day? Um, I just love, like I was never a very good employee. I get bored really quickly. Yes. Um, so, so I love the fact that we, especially with an online business, like there's always something new, something you have to figure out, something you have to try. Um, you're, like there's never going to be a point where I go, oh, okay, this business is sorted. Like I can just, you know, sit back and you don't need to do anything now. Like it's, you have to constantly be growing and developing and innovating and that sort of problem solving kind of thing is what really appeals to me. Like, which sort of sounds like I'm shooting myself in the foot. It's like, it's almost like I don't want the business to run smoothly. Um, yes. But it's, you know, that, that, it just keeps it interesting when you're always kind of trying new things out. Okay, what advice would you have for someone who's an employee right now yeah. and looking to build an online business and become an entrepreneur full time? What would your advice be and what was your experience doing that? Uh, well, I sort of I did it the long way around, definitely. Um, first five years were super lean, super tough, and then I kind of figured a few other things out. But I think um, from the start, like don't like don't go and invest a whole lot of money in building this whiz bang fancy website before you've even tested if people want it. Um, you 
what you think people want and what your friends agree and your mum agrees that people want doesn't necessarily have any bearing on what actually is going to happen. So um, try and there's a really great book called Lean Startup, which I'm sure most people are across, but you know, definitely testing things out with as minimum spend as possible, whether it's like a Kickstarter campaign or you know, just putting up a landing page or something and driving some Facebook ads to it to see if people are actually interested in what you want to sell. Um, and then the next thing would just be yeah, focusing on building your building your audience, wherever that is, like figure out who is your target market, where are they, and go to them there. And don't try and be everywhere, like there's just no point. I, you'll just be bad at everything, just, you know, or a little bit okay at everything. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, pick you one, focus on it, master it, and then, you know, then you can sort of like start adding other layers to it. Okay, and so you started your blogs quite a few years ago now, yeah. and I know a lot of entrepreneurs have a limiting belief that, you know, in 2016, it's not possible to build a blog like you have, you know, um, you know, in the way you have. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? What would you say to those entrepreneurs? Well, I think the thing is with, uh, the bloggers who are able to grow quickly and monetize quickly are generally the ones who are not trying to follow the traditional blogging model. Because the traditional blogging model is that you spend a few years building up an audience before you start making any money, which is just crazy. Like, why would you spend all that time? You know, you dedicate all this time into something and then you can start making a little bit of money. So um, I think if people can go in there from the start with a, like, try and keep try and have a specific niche, a specific person that you're talking to, whatever your topic is, like don't try and be super broad, but if you can try and yeah, find that, that one niche and just give value, give value, like do, um, you know, have like free email courses or eBooks or whatever, like just do that and build up your list. You'll find that naturally those people start asking for more and then you can start offering, um, you know, your own services or products or whatever. Like the ones that are successful are the ones who are, they're sort of like they're building up their own platform to then sell their own things mm -hmm. versus building up a platform to then get a percentage of selling someone else's things. Gotcha. Okay. And you can do that with a much smaller list as well. So what sort of blogging uh, income streams do you recommend for someone who's coming up, who's trying to start a blog? What are the ways that they can make money from it? Um, well, there's, there's lots and lots of different ones. It depends on what they want out of their blog. Like some people, they want their blog to be just a, this personal place where they talk about the things that they like. And if that's the case, then they are probably going to be better suited towards an ambassadorship or, you know, working with brands. But the better way to do that is to start early, start communicating with brands, start, you know, you know, showcasing what you can do for them from and start actually building a long-term relationship rather than just trying to get like a big campaign here and there once you've got the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, where, or other ones, if like, you know, if you've got any kind of skill or you're doing DIYs or you're showing people how to bake stuff or, you know, how to be healthier or any of those things, like if you're solving a problem for people with the stuff that you're sharing on your blog, then you can, that can be turned into a product of some sort, like whether it's a physical product or, a, you know, an online product or a, whether it's a course or whether you're, um, you know, you become an expert who then gets asked to speak at things. It's all about sort of, First, knowing what you want out of your blog, um, and then figuring out the different, the best way that's going to sort of work with what you want and what you can sort of offer. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, if you picture an entrepreneur who's who's looking to start a blog in the early days, yeah. what are the ways to build organic traffic? I mean, you've got a site, you've got no followers, no nothing. Yeah. What are the the entry level things that you recommend someone to do to start that blog? Yeah. So, um, well, the best thing to do is to start building up relationships with other bloggers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's through you know, it's going around commenting, finding blogs that are in similar um, niches or complementary niches and building relationships with them. So whether you start following them on social media and start sort of like actually chatting with them, asking them questions. Um, because especially at the start, blogs are kind of generally a yeah, new blogs. Most of their traffic will be other bloggers. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this quite nice reciprocal thing. And then as they, because they'll start sharing your stuff with their followers and vice versa. And you can do things like you can team up and do guest posting for each other, or you can, um, you know, there's a lot of bloggers who will do things where they might retweet stuff that someone said. Like you start building up your like your little group of online supporters basically. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the best, you know, feet in the door. If you're gonna do it with no budget, that's like the best way to do it. If you can spare even like a little bit of budget, then looking at things like um, Facebook ads or something like that, never to just get traffic because obviously that's just like pouring money down a, a hole there. But, yes. you know, if you can come up with some kind of, um, 
you know, opt-in offer or something like that um, and then start driving some Facebook traffic to that. Like even if it's like five or ten dollars a day, you could still, you know, over time build up like your email list and your, you know, obviously people are going to be seeing this Facebook ads and find out more about you and stuff. So Okay. And in your own world, what was the tipping point? So, you know, you might have had like one follower, a hundred followers, a yes. thousand followers. What was the tipping point and what do you think that you did to create that tipping point in your own blogs? Um, for us, the biggest tipping point, like this is the biggest jump, was actually when we got into um, Pinterest. Mm -hmm. So for us, um, for Job Your Gorgeous Daily, it's, you know, it's women's lifestyle. So it's recipes and fashion and beauty stuff and that's just what Pinterest is all about. Um, and like it's Pinterest is a slow burn, like it took a good probably about six months of pinning consistently and, you know, getting a few followers here and there. And then we just sort of reached a critical mass and we, we had this massive spike. We had a couple of things that sort of went viral and they're still, you know, giving us, you know, two, three years later, we're still getting a large percentage of our traffic from like these two posts that we wrote three years ago. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, that was, I think, it, yeah, it kind of comes down to figuring out where, you know, where your readers are and sort of mastering that thing. But I'm always very conscious that, yes, at the moment, majority of our traffic comes from Pinterest. Pinterest could change at any moment. Like, it's not it's not a guaranteed thing. So once we sort of felt like we had Pinterest handled, then I was like, okay, now what's what's the next thing? Because you've got to sort of make sure you've got those backup, backups in place, I suppose. Okay, and those two posts that you had that did really well that have created all that traffic, yeah. what do you think it was a, a, about those two posts that have still made people read it to this day? Um, well, one of them, I can like hand on my heart say that I have no idea because it was not our best work at all. It was actually a post I nearly didn't send live. I was like, the photos are too dark. It doesn't, you know, look, um, yeah, maybe we should reshoot it. But, and, um, but it, it's solving a basic problem. So our biggest, yeah, our biggest traffic driving post is a post about how to get rid of blackheads using Vaseline and Glad Wrap. Right. And it's a picture, it was a really overcast day. We take all the photos in our office. But it was a really overcast day and so they're all just a little bit, you know, a bit dark and grainy. And it's just one of the girl who was working for us at the time, uh, you know, we put it glider up on her nose and you know how you can do that to get rid of blackheads. And this like there's now about a hundred different blog posts dedicated to that blog post from other blogs where they've tried the method. So it's like, I think it was, it was a simple solution to a problem that a lot of people had, but it definitely wasn't our best work. Like, we've done a lot of those. So that one I'm not sure, but the other one um, we put a lot of time and effort into. Um, we've created, like, it's called the Ultimate Capsule Wardrobe, so it's the 35 um, items of clothing that every woman needs to own. Mm -hmm. um, and we went through and we, you know, we made really nice shareable graphic and we made sure that it was, you know, for each piece we sort of recommend stuff for different body shapes and stuff, so it's very useful and accessible kind of information um, done in a shareable way. So that's, like, I can see why that one went viral. The other one, I'm still like, I don't know, a lot of people have blackheads. I don't know. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Um, and what do you think about long-form content? So on our site, you know, we have some articles that go from 1,000 words up to 4,000 words. Yeah. Do you think that there's still a place in for, for long-form content? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it depends on, like, it all comes down to, um, and I actually think that's kind of what blogging is, shifting to because um, when I started out it was about just getting out as much content as possible like I actually went and met with um, the owners of one of like from the really big US sites a few years ago and his advice to me was just like just publish as often as you can like it doesn't matter if it's you know basically you know just rehashing and linking to something else like just you need to be posting like a minimum five six times a day and I was like oh god okay um, but it meant that you know the internet kind of got flooded with you know rubbish basically like um so i think people are now a lot more wary of that and to, to produce less but more valuable content so the long-form content like not only is it better for seo but it's generally giving more information to people makes you seem like more of an authority and it's the kind of stuff that people are going to share versus hey i like the shoe go buy it okay. Okay, and I've noticed on your site you've got some amazing graphics. So where do you get them from or do you create them yourselves? And what are the tips that you've found to create great great graphics for your blog? Yeah, so um, we've actually got a graphic designer who works with one day a week at the moment. She does all of our graphics and that was has been amazing. Um, but before her, we still like really tried to focus on creating um, images that were like branded as our sort of images. So we just um, originally just paid someone to do us a couple of different um, templates in Photoshop, so ones with you know our logos and colours and things that we could kind of mix and match around a little bit, 
and um, we use we were doing those all ourselves. But obviously now, um, yeah, we've got someone who can do it for us. But, but you know, there's things like Fiverr and stuff like that where you can get someone to you know make something a bit more special. And I do find that if you put that extra effort into things, it does get shared more often. And um, you know, doing infographics and stuff is always brilliant. Like people love to share that kind of stuff. So. Okay, and in terms of social media, what have you learned through the journey about social media and things that work and things that don't? Yeah, my number one lesson is the don't rely too heavily on one platform. Mm-hmm. Yes. So all of us. So initially, we were getting so much like Facebook was our main traffic driver, and then within three months, it disappeared. Like it went from being like seventy percent of our traffic to fifteen percent of our traffic, kind of just wow. you know changing. What, what caused that? Just a change in the algorithm. This was back when you know you could get really good organic reach from you know sharing. In pretty images basically yes. um, and then Facebook decided they didn't like posts with links in it and all that kind of stuff and obviously they keep tweaking and changing so I've noticed actually this week it started to come back up again I think they've changed something again which is good um, so you know we're quickly frantically running around trying to go okay well what do we do now so then that, that's when we kind of started focusing on, on Pinterest but um, I think it's Yes, figure out the one which is going to work best for you. Look around it. Look at what your competitors are doing. Because normally, like, why try and figure stuff out the hard way when people who started six months ago, 12 months ago, have already sort of figured it out? If you can see a trend, normally that's something that's probably worth trying. Um, but just sort of don't ever kind of count your chickens, I suppose. Like, it's all, it's everything, like, all social media has, is going to change and it has a life cycle and you've got to have that next thing coming in before, you know, that one goes out. So... Yeah, you've got to have your SEO, your email list, and then a couple of socials, and that will be make you a bit more stable, I suppose. Okay. And before I was listening to you guys on stage, and you were talking about scheduling software. Yeah. So I'm keen to know what you use, and um, and what are the things that you've learned? Is scheduling posts like is it can it be overkill to people? Uh, I know one of the girls mentioned about Snapchat that you know things like Twitter now when you're scheduling, you know, people know that and they know yeah. that you're not actually there posting. Yeah. What are your thoughts around that? Um, I think there's. We're trying to take like a bit of a 50-50 kind of thing. So with Instagram, I have one post that's scheduled to go out each day on uh, Secret Bloggers Business, and we have three scheduled to go out each day on Drop It Gorgeous Daily. Um, so, and they'll be, they'll be you know, different things depending on platforms. But then we try and put more organic stuff in between. But it just means that if you have a day when you're running around like a crazy person, you're busy, then you know, your content's still going out. So for Instagram, we use um, Schedulegram to do our mm-hmm. scheduling. Um, I believe a few other platforms are coming up that's actually going to let you properly schedule, but that one is all, that one actually lets you schedule from the web, it doesn't just pop up on your phone. Um, Pinterest, same kind of thing, I actually discovered a uh, really cool tool the other day called Board Booster. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, we use Tailwind to um, schedule our current content. So what we normally do is each week um, I have, we sit down and go, okay, well, what's coming up? So we're coming up to Easter now. So um, we'll go in and we'll schedule some, you know, we'll go search for some great stuff about Easter, about our own stuff from previously, plus the new stuff, plus other people's, so that we know that we've got that sort of topic covered as far as new content. But we've got over nearly 100,000 pins, wow. which is a lot. <laughs> yes. um, but with Board Rooster, what you can do is set it up to loop. So it will go and repin older pins um, for you to kind of fill it again, to, like to fill in the gaps. So you want to still be making sure you're doing your key important stuff yourself, but you can use these tools to kind of support you to keep the to sort of like keep it rolling along. So it means that yeah, we're scheduling about between fifty to hundred pins a day, and it takes about an hour, I think, which is a much and it's um, yeah, like in Pinch, again, like um, Pinterest, you don't need to be on there manually responding to stuff as much. It's not kind of what people expect. Yes. But with Facebook, for example, um, we have two posts that go up on Facebook a day and they're at set times and we try and make sure that we're there to respond to any comments at those times. So it's, yeah, it's a lot of different moving parts, but it's knowing sort of what works for, like, yeah, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you kind of need to be there to respond to stuff. Okay. But um, Pinterest is, the moment, it's just kind of that mass. <laughs> Okay. Um, can you maybe talk about building a team? So I heard on one of the podcasts that you did that you've got some interns. Yeah. And you said that you get them from universities. Can you maybe talk us through how you go about doing that? Yeah, sure. So um, the very first time I had an intern, it was just life-changing. I was, before I that, I was, you know, working completely on my own. And I think the first couple of times she came in, I just chatted to her. I was like, it's so amazing to have someone to talk to. It's great. Um, but now we work with a couple of the local unis. Um, they have it as part of their curriculum that people have to go out for a semester and do one day 
work at a related company. So it sort of works really well. Like they're getting experience with us and we're getting sort of that extra help. Um, but for me, all of the girls who now actually work for me as paid employees all started out as interns. So particularly as a startup or, you know, when your budget's tight, like hiring can be a really expensive process. If someone comes in and they're not a good fit, it's normally a couple months down the track, you know, you've wasted that money, you've got to go through the process again. So um, for sort of those, yeah, more junior roles, it's almost like a try before you buy kind of thing. And it's, yeah, worked out really well and a lot, of, a lot of my interns they've been amazing I've been you know tried to help set them up with jobs with friends and stuff as well because you know, the entrepreneurial community is very tight but yeah I think it's a really good um, I know some people have a problem with interning as a philosophy I think as long as you're not taking advantage of people and it's actually a legitimate internship program where they get value then I think it works really well for everyone and have you used freelancers as well? So I'm guessing you're not like a super tech person that can write code or anything like that. Have you have you used freelancers to help with your site and with your different digital products? Um, I actually do develop all my own stuff. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, I shouldn't because um, I tend to break it more than anything else at the moment. Uh, but yeah, no, he's use freelancers a lot. Um, I've sort of got like a team of people that I know they're not necessarily on staff but I've you know there's a couple of developers who I've used for you know the slightly more techy stuff or when I've crashed something and they need to fix it um so I've kind of got them on you know on call pretty much um and then you know for a lot of my content creation I use freelancers as well okay um and what about sort of giving back so as an entrepreneur I know that's a big thing for a lot of people what do you do to give back outside of just creating great content, you know, you're involved in charities or do you raise money for different causes? What do you do in that realm? Yeah, so um, I'm an official um, ambassador for Oxfam. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try and make sure that at least once a month we're doing content around raising awareness for the, what Oxfam's projects are and, you know, sharing some of their different uh, different ways that you can contribute to them. Um, and but also we last year started an online print store and what we do is we team up with um, artists and uh, calligraphers and you know how like on Instagram the cool handwriting stuff is kind of you know everywhere uh, we're trying to team up with those people and a charity that they support and we get them to produce um, something that we can create as a, like a printable piece of artwork and then we sell that 100% of um, the proceeds go to charity wow, cool. so that's out I mean it's still very early days at the moment um, we're still kind of building up and playing around with that but that was definitely something I kind of got to a point last year I was like okay we need to you know we've been focused on growth and us for so long it's now time to actually try and do something with a bit more heart to it which has been really good okay cool um, and what do you see as kind of an up-and-coming trend in the online space maybe like an app or is there something that you're seeing that you think might evolve uh, beyond what we're doing right now um, I'm really loving all the video streaming stuff at the moment, like like Periscope and now uh, Facebook's got that functionality, although it hasn't come onto my account yet. <laughs> um, and I think that is a great because it is live and it does kind of gives that authentic engagement, which is you know with all the scheduling and stuff like that, it does kind of get a bit removed and people like to see the actual people behind the scenes and what's happening. I think that's really really strong branding tool. Um, and yeah, as far as everything else, like. Video, video is massive and just being being a little bit more, it's not, I was going to say smarter, that's not the right word, but yeah, being a bit more, um, more clever about how you're interacting with people and what information you're giving them, don't just assume it's like a one size fits all, like kind of trying to give people a bit more customised experience seems to be something that's more and more, that's happening more and more and I think it's a really powerful um, trend. So you're saying, do you think YouTube's kind of dying off now with some of these new streaming services? Um, I'm not, yeah, I, I couldn't comment on that because I'm not actually, I, I don't know the stats or anything like that. I don't think it will ever overtake, I mean, at, at this stage, I don't know if the streaming would overtake YouTube because I think it offers a very different product. Yes. Um, but as far as uh, allowing people with uh, other methods of interacting with their, you know, with brands or with um, celebrities or with, you know, other people that they follow, I think it's just another great, yeah, it's, um, it's another skill that we're all going to have to learn how to do, basically. Okay, cool. Um, and so is there another blog that you follow that you think is, is really cool outside of your own one? Um, oh, I follow so many. I mean, I follow a lot of I follow a lot of people who do very similar stuff to me because it's always good to kind of keep your finger on the pulse. And there's some great um, bloggers uh, sharing their 
their knowledge and stuff as well. Um, there's a fab chick in the States called, um, her name's Mariah, and she's got a blog called Femme Entrepreneur, which is quite a mouthful, but mm-hmm. um, my blog's called Drop Big Blue Steady, so I can't talk on that. A very, very long title. <laughs> very long title. That'd be tip number one, short and punchy. Um, and no one can spell gorgeous, it's one of those words. Um, but, you know, she's... A, done amazing things in a very short period of time and is a really really interesting person to watch what she's doing actually she's only been going for about 18 months i think and she turned over like a million dollars last year so that's pretty impressive in that kind of space okay is there a favorite book that you'd recommend entrepreneurs to lead uh, to, to read i know you mentioned lead startup before is there another one outside of that um another one i read just recently was called the one thing i think that's really that was um I'm terrible with books. I start them. I only ever read, ever read the first like three or four chapters. But the first three or four chapters of that was really good. Um, and I also really loved. There's one called it's a bit woo woo. It's called um, Sacred Success, but it's about um, the mindset around you know when people start to be you know like self limiting and things like that, and how to kind of you know, allow yourself to do things you probably never imagined you could do, which I think is a quite important for entrepreneurs because yeah you can get in your own way quite a lot so have you done any personal development or self-development yourself um not probably just through reading and observing other people and um i think it's just more about the awareness as well um i did a course called um lucky bitch a few years ago which is an australian woman and it's just you know things you didn't i suppose things i didn't realize that i was doing which was sort of getting you know where you kind of like feet, let fear kind of stop you from doing certain things because it's, it's big and scary, you've never done it before. Um, and knowing when that's what, knowing how to recognize when that's what's happening and how to sort of, you know, manage yourself basically so that you can kind of keep on doing the scary things is quite a good tool to have. Okay, and is there a favorite quote that you live your life by? I know there's, there's thousands of them on the internet, but is there a particular one that you really love? Um, oh gosh, that's top of my head. I quite like the one, there's one um, which is actually from Lauren Conrad, so you know, an echelon of um, uh, entrepreneurialism, but it was that, yeah, she said, he asked what my favourite position was, I said, Stego, I was like, yeah, I like a bit of feminist, I quite enjoyed that one. <laughs> okay, and just finally, to, to wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share with our audience, maybe where they can find you or what your next project is? Yeah, definitely, so um, dropbitgoodsdaily.com, uh, if anyone's needing recipes or blackhead advice um, and secretbloggingbusiness.com is where I have my yeah I share I've got about four different blogging courses now from beginners through to um, the bloggers MBA is my sort of um, well it's my favorite one because it's all about showing people how to grow, build their audiences and monetize without you know having to wait five or six years to kind of to do it and it's yeah that's if anyone's looking to uh, grow their blog or looking to sort of monetize online businesses Definitely check that out. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Kate. Cool. Thank you very much.